McCarthy. Let me introduce you to Oakley Court. This grand Gothic mansion, now a hotel, was once used for exterior shots in many British films. Notably used by the Hammer Horror Film Company, their unique blend of period drama and fine performances was the influence behind many British horror films during the late 70s, the period of their infamous demise. One of the benefactors from this was a young filmmaker called Norman J. Warren. They proved that British horror was worthy of the world's attention. This programme takes a look back and reminds us of a great time of British filmmaking and a look at an independent filmmaker who dared to take Hammer one step further with a unique blend of new wave British horror films. So how did you start as an independent filmmaker? Well, actually, I don't think starting as an independent was the intentional thing. It really came from a desire. I was already working in the industry as a, an editor, an assistant director, and mm -hmm. so on. And, of course, my desire was to direct a film, a feature film. Feature film. And at first, of course, when I took scripts to people and so on, they said the usual thing, yes, thank you, it's very nice, and so on, but come back when you've had more experience, oh, and yeah. so on. The usual sort of catch-22. So um, with friends, a cameraman, and, and another cameraman who had one who owned an equipment company, we decided really that the only way we were going to achieve it was to try and make our own film. Mm -hmm. So really it was, a, this was the beginning of the independence by being forced into that situation. And we went through the usual horrors of trying to raise finance and met hundreds of people over the years who made promises and, uh, and of course none of those promises were ever fulfilled in the end. <laughs> and so we do, just out of frustration actually, we said in the end, well, let's just do it ourselves. And so the main producer, Les Young, who had a camera hire equipment company at the time, mortgaged his company and his home. Oh my God. And another one cancelled some shares that he had in Mothercare, which was fortunately doing very well at that time. And I put what needed, you know, a little bit of savings I had and my time. <laughs> and we said, right, we'll now make a film, which turned out to be a film called Satan's Slave. Ooh. Um, which <laughs> is a horror film, as the title would suggest. And uh, the reason for suggest for choosing a horror film was not only because that was the, the medium I personally liked and wanted to work in, mm -hmm. but we studied the market as to what was the most commercial film to make if you were making it yourself um, for a small budget. And uh, horror always came out on top. Mm. It was a choice. We could have made a exploitation film, but to be honest, we really didn't want that. You know, we preferred to go the horror route. Yeah, so, and yeah, make some money so, so and make say, more movies. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In respect to Norman J. Warren as a director, talking about his films, yeah. um, it's the fact that British films which I feel have died out as far as the horror genre goes, and maybe the science fiction genre goes, um, it's nice to know that maybe on your doorstep that British films were shot and you had a British horror film made here. Yeah. Um, the film in question was Tales of Witness Madness, which was made in the 70s. It's directed yeah. by Freddie Francis. And the house in question, which is the house on your left here, yeah. was used in one of the segments of the film itself, which starred Joan Collins. And obviously um, the interiors were studio. The exterior shots, which are set in the back of the garden, were actually shot at Shepperton. Right. And the bridge is used in that was the same bridge that Norman used in Prey. It's funny that you think about British films, the fact that this film was shot here. Um, you know, it's, this is Surrey, yeah. which is kind of supposed to be the quaint part of England. They shot this film here, and it's the fact that it's very, very, very British in its concept, in its yeah. look. I feel that's where film has changed now. Once upon a time, a film concentrated on a story you had the characters, you had characters that were clearly fleshed out, which I felt Norman's films worked well on that scale. You yeah. had characters that were fleshed out. Nowadays, 
films with like train spotting shallow grave it's it's more a multimedia exercise the film has a low budget mm. has to rely on gratuitous violence um, and, and bad language and there has to be a certain call list there it's not too cool to be British anymore your time has come Catherine you are 20 years old the age at which Camilla departed from this earth. You deserve to be told something about our sacred lady before you give your soul up for her. There's no need. Then we can proceed. The ritual burning. Take her. So how much did the film cost to make? Save and slave. Hmm. The total budget on Satan's Labour is, believe it or not, £35,000, uh, of which we had 15 in actual cash. And the rest we did on deferments with the hire companies and the technicians and so on. That's brilliant. So, um, yes, it's hard to cost... believe what it would cost now. How much would it cost now, do you think? Oh, it's hard to say now. I think you'd, you'd be lucky to come in much less than a million now, even if you made it in the same way. Hmm. But, uh, Where did you make it? Have we made it at a wonderful house in Purbright, in Surrey, which belonged to a baron and baroness. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. the house was discovered by the art director, Hayden Pierce, and um, they were pleased you know, to let us, well, were crazy enough, I should say, to allow us to go and, and film in their house. And it was a wonderful location, because mm. it, not only was it a large, fake Tudor house, it was full of genuine antique furniture, which was theirs. And it also had five acres of land at the back, including its own woods. The film Prey, also known as Alien Prey in the States, made in 1977 on the back lot of Shepperton Film Studios, was Norman's second film in the horror genre. For this, he continued a unique mix of isms. Cannibalism and lesbianism were key to the plot of an alien being and its arrival on Earth. His presence interrupts a relationship of two lesbian lovers, Jessica and Josephine, who take him into their home, totally unaware of his intentions and who he really is. For this quickly filmed venture, Norman manages to deliver a claustrophobic and nightmarish atmosphere of human drama as well as alien. No, it came from the sky. What did? I woke up and the whole room was filled up with this green light. And there was this noise like a roar. And then the light disappeared. Must have been a dream. What made you... Um, take the part? Take the part, yes. Straight you... out of drama school. Straight out of drama school. Very good drama school. Yeah. Where they told me, when you begin, you have to do everything that you're offered because you might never work again. Never work again. <laughs> and I thought, well, beats going up to Butlin's holiday camp and entertaining the tourists. <laughs> Come and make a movie at Shepherd and Studios with wonderful Norman J. Warren and uh, many others who shall at the moment remain nameless since I've got um, hysterical amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> but it was wonderful. It really was yeah. wonderful. We, we had a great time. We were a team. Everybody involved in it was making, had made wonderful movies. Yeah. Sally Faulkner was so supportive and she rescued me when I drowned in the middle of the film. The two characters in the film, Jessica and Josephine, played by Gloria Annan and Sally Faulkner, um, are alienated from the rest of the community. There's a wonderful piece of dialogue in the film in which Sally Faulkner says, you know, um, the people in the town talk about us. You know they talk about us. Who? People in the village. Why? I don't know. Jealous. And it instantly underlies the fact that they are alienated because they're lesbians, they are alienated from the rest of the town. You then had the Barry Stokes character who is alienated from his own kind and enters their world totally unaware of human existence, what it's about, how to survive, how to live, how to behave socially. And you have then the triangle, the human triangle. It's not a heterosexual relationship, it's a human triangle. It just, to me, from why I went into this business was not really to be an actress, was, it was eventually to make feature films and I sort of imagined myself able to do that one day. 
and so I really wanted to learn everything about it. Sure. And to be involved in, in an independent production, sure. you can do that because people will answer your questions, you know. They sure. really want to make movies. Yeah. It's not somebody handing them millions of pounds to do something and everybody's, you know. Yeah. Gloria Anna's character is a gentle, innocent character, bisexual, and you have the Sally Faulkner character, that's Josephine, who is an out-and-out -out militant lesbian. And there's a sequence in the film in which she is strongly rejected by the Barry Stokes character. And the Gloria Annan character sees the Barry Stokes character as a form of release, as escape. So the film is also about escapism, escaping that dominant side and the dominant kind of thing. And the film fleshes that out beautifully. Norman has fleshed out the three characters and given them an individuality. I think that's quite rare with a horror science fiction film, which you don't get. And I just wanted it to work. I wanted it, the whole the character to come across, and that somehow this strange story yeah. would be real. That the the girl would be real for people, yeah. not just um, you know, not real. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is the shot. If we look over here, yeah. we just walk a little bit here. This is where we shot uh, Cray. You shot Cray. Yeah, this famous place. I had a parrot in here, which I see has been probably eaten by some monster. Yeah. <laughs> All the plants are gone too, but it's wonderful, isn't it? It's changed quite a lot, really, hasn't it? Mm. I wonder if the same guy who did Kew Gardens did this place. <laughs> <laughs> I think actors trained in this country, I'm Canadian, but I went to drama school here. You want, you're not it's a totally different thing than the rest of the world. You, you really want to do this job and you will do anything to do it. To do it. Yeah. And whereas at home, you say, okay, are they paying me to get to the studio? Or, and you wouldn't do it. It's yeah. a kind of a diff different uh, training. What do you mean? We've never played this game before. You're like a caged animal. No, Anders, it's not like that. I can do what I want and I can go where I want. I prefer to stay with Joe because she protects me and she loves me. That was easy. No imagination at all. It was just a practice run so Anders would understand. Now it's your turn to be the hunter. Count to 50 and we'll hide. I think, really, I mean, it would have been difficult to do a heterosexual relationship. It would be difficult to have an alien invade the lives of a heterosexual couple because within Prey, the Gloria Annan character, played by Gloria Annan, that's Jessica, she needs to escape. She's dominated throughout the film and she needs to escape. She's dominated by a person of the same sex, which makes the film more interesting to start with. Um, if it had been a husband and wife relationship, it would have been instantly cliched, I think. As with this film, it's not cliched. It's totally not about that. It's about a love triangle and it's a human drama within a science fiction horror film and I think that's a very rare quality. I only did it to protect you. He is insane. I do, but I agree entirely with what Gloria is saying about the relationships. Uh, it would have been nice to have had the opportunity to work on that more, as it would have been with the, the alien, you know, played by Barry Stokes, the alien in his search for food on Earth, and he's an encounter with this unusual couple, as far as he was concerned. Um, but there really wasn't. Unfortunately, the film was made at a great pace, I mean, speed. Yeah. It was, I've that never actually run or worked so hard. For, for, such, a, for such a great it, pace, there seems to be a lot, oh, indeed. lot achieved. But I was going to say on the script, you see, it was the same thing. I mean, remember that Terry Marcel asked me if I was interested in doing the film, to which I said yes, and he had the idea for the story. And he said, we haven't got a script at the moment, or, and by the way, we have to start filming in three weeks. Well, I mean, we actually started without a script. And mm. so, uh, so that's why I said there wasn't time to, to develop. And we were all thrown into it very fast. Mm. And then with a 10-day shooting schedule, yeah. um, as Glory said, it was really much a question of let's get on to the next shot. And, mm. The actors, who I think they, the whole cast did a wonderful job because they had to be left very much to their own devices. For Norman's next venture, the budget was stepped up once more for the special effects required for the visually challenging film Terror. 
inspired by Dario Argento's Suspiria made in 1976. Reissues of garish colours, odd lighting and masterful set pieces, Norman and his collaborators were impressed by this European approach, which Terra managed to do in its own style. Suspiria, 1977, directed by Dario Argento. Terra, 1978, directed by Norman J. Warren. What's the connection, I hear you say? Well, Terra basically was very heavily influenced by Suspiria. To the extent that there's a witch, there has to be a witch, doesn't there? Some very unrealistic but effective lighting, lots of reds and greens flooding the screen, and plenty of blood and flashing knives what you'd expect from a Jarlo type movie. In fact, Terror has been described as a British Jarlo, and that's a very accurate description. It's a very brutal film, though because of the, the slight supernatural overtones of the movie, maybe this is diffused slightly to the extent that it has actually been passed uncut for this country, which is something of a first. <laughs> doubt very much whether you could get away with making this kind of movie nowadays. I mean, the British film industry was devastated by uh, the Tories coming to power in 1979 and uh, it's only just starting to really pick up again as of now. And there really isn't the, the market nowadays in this country for this kind of film, I think. Uh, too much nonsense has been said about violence in films and video nasties and, and all that stuff for people to feel comfortable with making an out and out horror movie like this, which is a dead shame because basically we need people like Norman J. Warren to be making films like this. You know, we can't just have endless period dramas set in India and wherever. You know, they're great for Britain and they're great films, but you know, there's room for some exploitation as well and I feel this has gone out of the British filmmaking industry and we need it back badly. Films that we made ourselves that way, Tara was certainly the most successful. And Tara actually got a release everywhere throughout the world uh, theatrically and then later of course on, on video and then television um, but on its initial release in the cinemas it, it was actually doing so well at all of the theatres and in fact one only, it was only for one week but a, a point that's always <laughs> I'm actually very excited about because it was so unbelievable and I still can't believe it now that for one week in London it was actually the number one film mm. it had outgrossed all the big films I mean, it only lasted one, for one week, but it was really nice to see it on the front page of the trade papers and to realise that, you know, our little film that was made really with a lot of um, affection for what, what we were doing and very little money, that there it was uh, really pulling in big audiences. OK, Nigel, compared to other British uh, horror films that were being made, how do you think Norman's films stand, stand out? Well difference is, is a whole difference in style and approach really. In the mid 60s uh, Dracula may well have risen from the grave for Hammer but by the mid 70s Hammer was sinking into the grave and a whole new style of horror was coming along. In America we had Wes Craven making Last House on the Left, a few years later we had Toby Hooper making The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the face of much more gritty brutal horror movies like that which took their basis in everyday occurrences and were obviously things that could happen in real life. The old fantasy type films that Hammer had done so well with in the 50s and 60s really didn't cut it anymore. It's, you know, they have their place, they're great fun, but along came a new wave of British low budget, new wave horror filmmakers if you like, like Pete Walker with House of Whipcord, Frightmare, and of course Norman J. Warren with Satan's Slave and Terror, which we've already talked a bit about. And um, yeah, even though Satan's Slave and Terror both have witches in and uh, a kind of sub-Hammer story running underneath it. There's a lot of things to, to kind of earth them in everyday occurrences. They're, they're kind of basically things that you feel could happen. They take place in recognisable locations in Britain. They have people talking the, the then current language of the times, wearing the clothes of the times. Audiences then could equate more with what was happening on the screen rather than Count Dracula coming out of a castle in Transylvania and I think that's mainly the difference.
For Norman's last major contribution to the genre film in 1980, with the award-winning cult movie Inseminoid, released as Horror Planet in the United States. The film was chosen at the Trieste Festival of Science Fiction Films, and also received an award at the Madrid Science Fiction and Horror Films Festival. With this being Norman's most expensive production, costing in a region of £1 million, he again secured a fine cast of acting talents, including Robin Clark, Stephanie Beecham, Judy Geeson and Victoria Tennant. In his seminoid, a group of explorers arrive on a desolate planet and find markings of an ancient civilization on a cave wall. The civilization turn out to be alien in every way. And later on in the film, they impregnate one of the crew members, Sandy, played brilliantly by Judy Geeson, whose sufferings turns out to be consequences for the rest of the crew. And later on, right at the very end of the film, she finally gives birth to one of those aliens. Oh no. Gary, what's the matter? She's... She's breathing the atmosphere. She's... She's what? Oh no. By the time we were doing Inseminoids, of course, you had Alien, which was a big production in 20th Century Fox, and uh, you know, and certainly no small independent producer could actually match anything of that size. And so, sadly, you know, a lot of the horror and science fiction things were beginning to fade away in the way that we'd done films before then. Uh, so Inseminoid was really one of the last, I think, of independent made films of that type made in England. Jesus. Now we'll never know what happened. It's the end of our project. It's always a struggle to find somebody who will be willing to finance your dream, you know, yeah. the, the film that you want to make. Uh, but what, is changed, what has changed now from going way back from Prey and Satan's Slave that we talked about earlier, which remember that's quite a few years ago now, uh, the biggest problem is that the industry itself has changed. And so it's, uh, even if you go through all the struggle of raising the finance, the big problem today is to actually get your cinema, the, your film, so it's seen uh, in mm -hmm. the cinemas, because the, sadly, the independent cinemas and the small distributors are, are really a thing of the past now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but c c couldn't you just go to the, find out who the head honcho is in, the, in distribution companies, like territory by territory? And, oh, yes, you can. And as long yes. as you have a track record, of some ah, kind. yes, yes. You could say, yes. okay, I made this much. That's the problem, I suppose. <laughs> Independent productions, you get stolen ah, blind on when you, yes, you do, start yes. out. Um, yes, you could do that. But what I'm saying is that mm. the system has changed in so much that the because there's no independent cinema, mm. it's, it's not easy to get your film, Showing even if somebody is willing to it. put it and wants to, mm. it's very hard to find an opening to put it onto a screen, and hopefully several screens, because one screen is not really going to produce a great deal of return for you. Could you um, go to film festivals and oh, yes, say, yes. produce, a, like, a, this is what I want to do, this is who will be in it, this is how much it's going to cost, um, and then get a big company interested oh yes you can i mean when i say you can i mean yeah. you could try that and you could be very lucky mm. yes you should certainly do but i think really you try every avenue open to you mm. and certainly going to film festivals and all the film markets um such as can the one we all know of because yeah. of, behind all that razzmatazz there is actually a, a marketplace you know, with the hard selling and buying is going on mm -hmm. as with the american film market and the mifed in in italy every year and, uh, and sundance now which has become now Incredible. become a major market to go to yeah, yeah. Um, why don't we have a sundance here why don't we get one of our i don't major know no england is very behind on that i'm afraid i mean we had the london film festival which but that really doesn't uh, I mean, it's a nice thing and films get seen there which are not going to be seen anywhere else mm. but it's not really a marketplace yet so no. now england doesn't have there's nothing in England that happens like that yet. No, don't ask me why. But, uh, we have we've always tended to be the old quite school a few years tie. Behind. I think gets in the way. Ah, uh, very much so. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> horrifying to 
today. This it is a problem, I think, because sadly to say, you know, we are sort of surrounded by so many sort of natural horrors all the time. I think everybody is getting to the point where they're almost anaesthetized when it comes to, um, to nasty incidents that you might see in a horror film. And having said that, the, the very basic um, shock moments and so on, if you could make people jump, that still seems to work. And I'm convinced that's because it's coming back to our basic uh, instincts again, you know, basic emotions. It's back to the, you know, the whole thing of people saying boo, and it makes you jump. Um, and that's what I mean by sort of shock moments. Uh, but showing something which is horrifying, it, it's obviously becoming more and more difficult. But I would still say that you can do it, I think, if you can create that atmosphere um, in a film, you know, have with a, a good story, good characters, uh, characters that you actually believe in and, and want to know and get to know, uh, then when you introduce anything that's going wrong, I think you can still you can get an audience reaction to that. With the recent re-releases of Norman Warren's films on video cassette. The interest in independently made British productions obscured by the vast output of genre films made during the 70s appears to be ripe. Although still remaining obscured, there seems to be a revival of interest in this period which came just before the time of the mass markets of video and the cinema multiplex. The making of small genre independent films in Britain has greatly diminished, yet the indications of video sales, literature and documentaries like this one suggest an interest still to be there. Perhaps it is our need to see different ways of storytelling rather than the mass productions of the big studios, what we are told is trendy. When we were filming Prey on the very first day and we were doing that scene where uh, the Barry Stokes char alien character is drowning in the river ash, yes. was anybody aware that I was actually in trouble, that I was actually going down for the third time as you filmed on <laughs> and on and on? No, I had to be very honest with you, we didn't think. We didn't realise that you actually were in trouble. Naturally, we just thought you were giving an most amazing performance. And as you said, it was your first day on the film at all for all of us. <laughs> and we were thinking, what a wonderful actress. This is so convincing, you know, how to portray a drowning. That, uh, Sally Faulkner, yeah. you know, she literally, she noticed finally that I, and she reached around and grabbed me and hauled us both out of the river. And then the um, ambulances came and picked us up. My That's first right. day on my first <laughs> film at drama school, I'm taken by ambulance to the hospital. And then the nurses were all asking us, um, we're going to give you a, a tetanus shot. Actors probably like getting needles. <laughs> really? Yes. Yeah. I just thought we were all potential drug addicts. Yes. And we <laughs> just go along for your daily fix. Yes. yes. Oh, oh, God. No, I didn't know that. No, I mean, I mean, maybe going to the hospital for your tetanus. Yeah. Mm mainly because that river as well was not exactly clean, if I remember rightly. Send advance parties immediately. I've now established humans high in protein and easy prey. <laughs> <laughs>